Well, obviously we're in session 13, where we're going to see the Lamb open this seven-sealed book. And uh, pursuant to that, let's just back up, realize in chapter 1 of Revelation, this book gives us an outline of the entire book. John is instructed to write the things which he had seen, which was the, and, and the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta hereafter. The things he had seen by verse 19 of chapter 1 was the vision of Christ in chapter 1. An actual vision of the resurrected Christ. And the details of that are used as links throughout the rest of the book. Then he writes about the things which actually existed at that time. The things which are, namely, seven representative churches. Which were both literal churches on the one hand, and yet also provide an astonishing profile of all of church history. Acts, book of Acts covering about the first 30 years of church history, and those two chapters, the coming 2000s. But having, and that, and let me emphasize again for any of you that have just joined us, the most important part of the entire book is chapters 2 and 3. And so I encourage you to avail yourself of the materials to, if you don't study any other part of the book, to really master chapters 2 and 3. But at this point, we are going forward to the things which shall be after these churches. And uh, that's from chapter 4 to the end of the book. So that's our focus. We're in the third of three sections, in a sense of speaking. And uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, uh, John says, After this I looked. And the word after this is metatauta, the same word as before. Uh, um, after this I looked, and behold, the door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, at as it were, a voice of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. That same word, metatauta, in the Greek. So, for a lot of the reasons that we've mentioned before, we believe that this is the point in the chronology of things that the rapture takes place. Because John is called up to heaven and we find a lot of other things. We've, he encounters something very fascinating. He encounters, among other things, 24 elders. And uh, these 24 elders are a representative group. We learn from 1 Chronicles 24. The only place 24 occurs in the Bible is when David organizes the 24 courses of the priests. And 24 leaders of those 24 courses represented, of course, the complete group. There are a lot of speculations among scholars as to what these elders are. There's no need to speculate. It's very important, as you'll see why as we get into subsequent chapters. You need to satisfy yourself as to who those elders are. It's not just a peripheral thing. It's not just a question of, gee, one person's conjecture. There are many things in the book. Many of us will have slightly different perspectives. But this is something that's really crucial, so we want to focus on it. We know they cannot be the tribulation believers. Some say, well, those, they represent the people that were in the tribulation that were believers. And from chapter 7, 13, 14, it says, we find a verse in, the coming, in one of the coming chapters. It says, one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? He said, you, sir, you know. He said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation, which have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. See, one of the elders is answering that. So one of the elders ain't one of them. Do you follow me? That's the point. Okay, the other conjecture by many people that write books on this is, that, well, these are angels, some kind of the super council of angels. Well, if you look at verse 11 of chapter 7, there's a, the verse says, all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and so forth. How many of the el angels were there? By the way, can you imagine that? There are a lot of angels. They were all around the throne and around the elders. So clearly the angels are distinctive from the elders. That's the point. And there, others speculate the nation Israel. And we'll be dealing with that in chapter 7 and 12. We'll put that to bed. So who are they? The good news is you can nail this one. This is not an a, uh, interpretive thing. You pretty much can uh, demonstrate that they have some distinct, the elders have some distinguishing characteristics. What are they? They're on thrones. It says seats in some translation. That's a mistranslation. It's thronos is the Greek. They're wearing white raiment, which specifically is identified as the righteousness of Christ. They have crowns of gold. And they sing a song that is absolutely revealing that we'll take a look at. And by the way, they're called elders and kings and priests. And uh, so 
Out of the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. This is in chapter 4. These lamps of fire we encountered in chapter 1. In chapter 1 we encounter them, and Jesus himself identifies what they represent. The last verse of chapter 1 of Revelation says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest my right hand, Jesus says, and the seven golden lampstands, seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. But it's those lampstands that are now in heaven in chapter 4. Do you get me? When you put this all together is the reason most conservative scholars recognize that chapter 4, verse 1, is the rapture. And so that's important to understand. But then we encounter chapter 5 with this critical document called the Seven Sealed Scroll. When it says book in some translations, realize that that was written before they have codex, codexes. When you see something with pages, that's called a codex. It be, it be, that, uh, they really get used about the second century AD. Back in the first century, you're still dealing my, primarily with scrolls. And we talked about that last time in more detail. But anyway, and these scrolls can be sealed so in such a way that you break one seal, you can unroll part of it. And you break another seal and ro- unroll a little bit more. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now this backside thing is important because that implies that it's a will or a title deed. Because they don't normally write on the backside of papyrus. The scroll is made, of, made up of 8 by 10 papyrus sheets that are sewn together into a, a stream and then rolled up. And uh, the backside is rough. It's hard to write on. But the outside is where they put the requirements that had to be met for it to be opened. And we saw an example of that in uh, Jeremiah, where Jeremiah is told in, in, on the uh, uh, edge of the time when the Babylonians were about to conquer... In fact, Je- Jeremiah is in prison, and he's told to buy a piece of property from a, from a cousin. And he does. He follows exactly that. This is just by review of last time. And he, he, it's kind of a strange thing. For 70 years, he knows that for 70 years they're going to be in captivity. He himself might not even survive. So why is he buying a piece of land? Because God told him to. Why is he doing that? To give us an example to follow, because they, he, he pays for the land. The title deeds put in earth and jarred and buried. So after when they return from the seven years, his heirs can claim by opening the seals and claiming the land. And that's, that was all in Jeremiah 32 for those of you who want to get into it in detail. But uh, so, okay. Continuing chapter 5, and just as a warm-up here, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? So it, it took some special requirements. In fact, the next verse says, No man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. It had to be a man. It turns out it had to be a kinsman of Adam. And no one is qualified. You and I don't get it. We just read it and try to understand what's going on. John understood, because in the next verse, verse 4, he says, And I wept much. In fact, I sobbed convulsively, is what the Greek implies. Because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. Had to be a kinsman, there were none qualified. Fortunately, there's an exception that's about to be explained to him. And to understand what's coming on, one of the background things you should have been doing is reading the book of Ruth, a little four-chapter book, but that little book is a treasure chest of of prophecies. Um, And uh, the book of Ruth is one of the classic models of God's plan of redemption. In it, there's a hero by the name of Boaz, he takes the role of a goel, which is a Hebrew term for the kinsman redeemer. And uh, you also learn about the law of redemption, how land is redeemed, and the law of the Leverite marriage. When here's Ruth, a Gentile, she becomes his bride. And in a whole, in the plot line, the redemption of the land to Naomi, um, I mean uh, the bridegroom, uh, uh, Boaz, is accomplished. And it's a model of Christ's redemption. To give you a typological analysis, the goal is kinsman redeemer. There are four requirements to be a goal. He had to be a kinsman. He had to be able to perform. But it was voluntary. He had to be willing to perform. And he had to assume all the obligations of the beneficiary. Those four conditions. And in in the story of Ruth, Boaz does that. He's the hero of the peace. And uh, Boaz is the lord of the harvest and the kinsman redeemer in the story of Ruth. Naomi represents Israel. She's exiled from the land. And that makes this all possible, the whole story possible, in effect. Ruth becomes the Gentile bride of Boaz. That shocks many people who really understand the Jewishness of it is because it was prohibited in the law to take a Moabitess to wife. 
But, but um, Boaz does. What, what law could not do, grace does. What most people don't understand, because they haven't done the homework, you have to understand who Boaz's mother was. It was Rahab the harlot of Jericho, was his mother. So he was, anyway. Um, she also may have been married through, uh, may have had lineage through Zared, but that's a whole other thing. Um, some observations about the book of Ruth. This is sort of a, a graduate quiz for those of you who think you know the book. I want you to notice that in order to bring Ruth to Naomi, Naomi had to be exiled from her land. See, the exile was a necessary prerequisite. Think about that. Bear in mind that Naomi is the type of Israel and Ruth the type of the Gentile bride. What the law could not do, Grace did, of course. Ruth does not replace Naomi, despite what most churches teach today, in effect. Ruth learns of Boaz's ways through Naomi, but Naomi meets Boaz through Ruth. Very strange, if you think it through, what that implies typologically. No matter how much Boaz loved Ruth, he had to wait for her move in that famous thrashing floor scene in chapter 3. Anyway, and Boaz, not Ruth, confronts the nearer kinsmen. And you can uh, jot those down and sort them out as you get a chance to double back on this. Let's get back to Revelation 5 for the review here. One of the elders said unto me, oh, by the way, notice something interesting. Throughout the book of Revelation, if it's something about heaven... That's explained to John by one of the elders. When the living creatures speak, it's about the earth. In chapter 6, it's going to be all about opening seals and all these wild things. The living creatures are the ones doing the task or explaining. But in heaven, what's going on in heaven is explained to John by his escort, one of the elders, interestingly enough. Anyway, one of the elders saith unto me, John says, Weep not! He sobbed convulsively because no one's been worthy to open the book. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God which set forth the all the earth. This is the first time in the book of Revelation, we start hearing Jewish labels. You, didn't ha you had all kinds of titles of Christ in the seven churches. All he had a seven different titles he used in seven different letters, right, of himself. The Son of God, this, that, and the other thing. You'll notice from this point on, the book of Revelation turns very Jewish for some very good reasons that we'll begin to understand as we go forward here. It says, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Hath prevailed, so forth. The lamb. As it, that, that was the title of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist first introduced Jesus Christ publicly twice. He said, Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a Jewish title. It's a Passover illusion, illusion if you will. Now remember, in the introduction that the book of Revelation consists of 404 verses that include over 800 allusions from the Old Testament. So one reason it seems strange to us because we haven't done our homework in the Old Testament. You with me? So, but here we're going we're to get increasingly into Old Testament labels all the way through this now. The lion of, see, the lamb was his first coming, idiomatic of his first coming. The lion is a second coming. And in his mandate that he claimed from Isaiah 61 when he stood up in Nazareth, he stopped at the comma when he read that, if you may recall. And uh, he's, he didn't read then the day of vengeance of our God. But that's what the lion is all about, forthcoming. Okay, the seven horns, of course, are a symbol of power and honor from all through the Old Testament. Seven eyes are the, speak of the seven spirits of God and so forth. And uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, I want you to want to emphasize the... Jewish labels that are emerging here. The line, he, that was Jacob's final blessing to his sons. You can follow. What you, I encourage you to do if you have a concordance, take these thoughts and carry them through the scripture and you'll discover a thing they call the law of expositional constancy. What they mean by that is the Holy Spirit tends to use idioms consistently. And you'll study a lion all the way through. And uh, there are places that the lion isn't necessarily a type of Christ and yet it'll be idiomatic of something about Christ nevertheless. 
the root of David. Now this is a fascinating one that he is the root of David and yet a descendant of David. And he used that paradox to confuse the Pharisees, you may recall, I think in Matthew 22. He's the result of David's line on the one hand, and yet he was the one that brought David into existence. And so he, when the Pharisees were getting a little frisky, Jesus gave them that conundrum to unravel, and they, they, couldn't, they couldn't, couldn't cut it. It's in, you know, anyway. And so, uh, so his line was to rule over all the whole earth. His line is to rule over the whole earth. Think about that. Nine out of ten churches in America deny that. They don't mean to, but they do in effect. The whole idea that he's literally going to rule the planet earth through Israel on, on the earth. That was committed all through the Old Testament, committed to David in 2 Samuel 7. And that's what Psalm 2 is all about. And this was confirmed to Mary at the Annunciation. So that's what, we're, that's what we're dealing with head on here in the book of Revelation. That's one reason, by the way, the book of Revelation is uncomfortable for many churches, many pastors to teach because you can't escape the reality that it's the climax of all the commitments made in the Old Testament. You've got to somehow spiritualize them away somehow. Anyway, Jesus comes up and he's to the, up to the Father. He said, he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now that's called access, huh? And when he had taken the book... The four living creatures and the four twenty elders. By the way, I keep saying the word beast is an unfortunate translation. It's a different word than therion, which is used later in some other cases. The word here is really zoa. It's a living creature. It's, it, the word beast in our vernacular tends to sound negative. It, and I meant to, uh, to editorialize that. I forgot to. When he had taken the book, the four beasts, the four, four living creatures, and the four twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, singing. You, by the way, take the word new song and take that through the scripture and track it down. You'll find it's an interesting study. Saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Who is speaking? Who is singing this? The 24 elders are saying, they, they, the 24 elders, sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals there, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and had made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Us, us, and we. There is one manuscript out of Alexandria which has this in the second person. Thou hast, thou hast redeemed them to God and made them to our God, and they shall reign. One manuscript came out exactly, which was the, the headquarters of the Gnostics. Out of 25 manuscripts, one has that error, and yet because of that, some of your Bibles will try to create doubt as to the identity of the 24 elders. It's, it's not scholastically defendable. In any case, though, you go back to chapter 1, and John himself says... As he opens the book, in the fifth verse of the whole book, he says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from his sins in, in, uh, our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father, and to him we glory and dominion forever and ever. That, should, that settles the argument. There are only three people that are both kings and priests, Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, and the redeemed. Okay? So you need to understand that because you're going to encounter a lot of discussion but who the 24 elders are we? Do, does the church go through the Great Tribulation or not? That's a very pivotal issue, very practical issue for a lot of reasons. So let's jump in. Now, there are clouds on the horizon. We've had a lot of fun up till now to, in the last couple of chapters with here up in heaven and all this great stuff is going on and all this praise and worship is going on. Now we're shifting to chapter 6. And we need to face squarely that this is, there are dark clouds on the horizon here. Your man tells us that the world, the world is getting better and better all the time. Right? God says they are going to become increasingly worse as you see the decay in society, not just in the United States, in general. The immorality, the, prevalent, uh, the, 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 the prevalence of uh, teenage venereal disease, uh, unwed mothers in their teens with their second and third children, um, and on and on and on. Um, it's exactly what the Bible predicts. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Man says that peace among nations is close at hand. How many have heard that? 
God says there are going to be wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdoms, and so forth. Man expects to win the battle against disease, famine, and hardship. God says there are going to be fearful judgments of disease, famine, and hardship. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to hit this head on tonight. The good news as we go forward is we're going to be watching what God's describing from the mezzanine. We're going to be in the, among, we're represented by the 24 elders. That doesn't mean there aren't dark times ahead for us here on the earth, but not what we're going to be dealing with here. The Great Tribulation is a very special issue we'll deal with. Back in the 70 weeks of Daniel, you remember there were th three key verses. Verse 24 was the scope of the whole thing. Verse 25 was the 69 weeks that were fulfilled when Jesus rode that donkey presenting himself as the Mashiach Nagi to Israel. Verse 27 is the 70th week I'm going to come to. Well, you and I are in this interval called, that's embraced by verse 26, which consists of things that happened after he rode that donkey, but before the 70th week started. That included the cross. That included the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem that Luke details. In fact, Jesus detailed 38 years in advance to Luke. That's in Luke 21. And we're obviously coming to the end of verse 26. What we're going to be focusing on is the 70th week. As we, in fact, the, the, that week is defined, not by the rapture, it's defined by a covenant being enforced by a coming world leader, you may recall. He violates that covenant in the middle of that seven-year period by an event called the abomination of desolation. We won't badger that here right now. And this period of time, this, this, this seven-year this seven period is split into two halves that are spent called three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days in different places. It is the most documented period of time in the entire Old Testament. It's the most documented period of time in the New Testament. Very, the Holy Spirit's gone out of his way to make it very specific. The period from that, that um, abomination of desolation to the end of that week is labeled by none other than Jesus Christ himself as call, he's called the Great Tribulation. There's lots of persecution, tribulation before then, don't misunderstand, but there's a definitive period of time that is unprecedented, has never happened in the past, and will never happen again, that will last in the, notice it's three and a half years, it's not seven. Everybody calls, speaks of the seven-year tribulation, that's a misnomer. I understand it, and you won't get away from it, because people just do. But the Great Tribulation is three and a half years, the seventh week of Daniel is a seven-year period. Six years and 11 months, actually, but anyway. This period is called in the Old Testament the time of Jacob's trouble. This 70th week is critical because it heralds, if you will, the second coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom on the planet Earth. Revelation chapter 6 through 19 is a detailing of this 70th week of Daniel. That's our premise. Don't accept it. Study it yourself. Come to your own conclusions. But it, so you know where our perspective is coming from, that's our view, and we'll show you why. I want to also point out, as we will as we go forward, that this period is called the Day of the Lord and several other similar titles. It's also the outpouring of God's wrath, not Satan's wrath, God's wrath, okay? Now, the order of events, we have a false peace, apparently, in which this is going to be violated by this desecration of his agreement by this world leader, and then that, that ushers in the Great Tribulation. The Battle of Armageddon is the climax of that week, which is interrupted by the second coming of Christ. The Harpazo, the rapture, occurs sometime prior to the beginning of that week. This week's defined by, the, by a treaty that the world leader enforces. In order to enforce that treaty, he has to be known publicly. 2 Thessalonians 2 teaches us that before he can appear publicly, the rapture is a prerequisite condition for several different reasons, but that gets into the, technic, the, the Greek. So the harpazo occurs not at, but sometime prior. It might be a day before, it might be 30 years before. We don't know, but there is an interval between the harpazo and the 70th week, that, that treaty being confirmed. Up in heaven is where we'll, the, 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 uh, the harpazo saints will be uh, uh, dwelling. We accompany him with, we accompany him with his uh, 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 arrival in the second coming, that every eye shall see him and so forth. The first event happens in secret, the second one, we went through all that last time. Okay. The Bema seat, the, the giving of the uh, crowns and the rewards for uh, faithful service, the marriage supper, these are all events that occur in heaven and uh, we'll be dealing with later in the book. Satan's bound in the millennium and uh, he'll be released at the end of the millennium for another final 
climax. The Great Tribulation, it is defined by Jesus Christ himself, and he happens to be quoting, apparently, from Daniel 12. And uh, in Matthew 24, Jesus says, For then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. In other words, it'll be worse than the Nazi persecution in Germany. Many people try to make this fit that. No, that took one Jew out of three. Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9 indicates that the next one's going to take two out of three. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. I believe, by the way, that's, te that's a technology statement. That's an allusion to what we call uh, weapons of mass destruction. We couldn't visualize verse 22 occurring during the days of the Civil War, say, or earlier, because bows and arrows or muskets and bayonets doesn't cut it to wipe out the entire planet. But today, there's inventory many times over in storage that could easily do it. Jesus apparently is quoting or alluding to uh, Daniel 12, first verse, where uh, in Daniel it's, uh, the, it says, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. That's his job description, by the way. Michael is a warrior, chieftain, on behalf of Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book, and on it goes. There's a phrase in Jeremiah verse 30, chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And there will be a core group, a remnant, obviously saved out of that. Jesus explained the purpose of all history at the end of Matthew 23, just before the Olivet the Discourse. Jesus himself said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings? But, and ye would not. And behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth until ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The purpose of all history, how I would have gathered thy children together as a hen gathered her chickens. That was his goal. That's what he would have preferred. The tragedy of all history is that when he came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. So behold, your house is left to, because of that, your house is left to you desolate. For I said, but the triumph of all history is when he finally is accepted. A prerequisite condition for the second coming of Christ is for Israel to acknowledge their offense and to petition his return. That's why Satan's trying to wipe out, not just the Jews, the believing Jews. See, the purpose of the tribulation is expressed by God himself in the last verse of Hosea chapter 5, where God says, I will go and return to my place. That's a strange phrase. In order to return to his place, he must have left it. When did God leave his place? When he came to the earth as a man. I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. That's singular and specific. And seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. The purpose of the tribulation is to drive them to the wall. The sequence is clear. The tribulation doesn't begin until the Lamb opens the seal, right? We're about to see the seals open. That's going to launch all these wild things. The Lamb doesn't open the seal until He receives the scroll. The Lamb doesn't receive the scroll until after the 24 elders place their crowns on the glassy sea, right? In other words, we're up there before the Lamb receives the scroll. The 24 elders and the seven lampstands are in heaven when the tribulation begins. Important. It's going to be very important to you because as you get into some of the other stuff, you're going to start worrying. Are we going to be here then? No. There are people that try to convince you that they, think we're the, they say we're guilty of wishful thinking. No. No. We're just trying, to, we're trying desperately to understand what God is saying. We believe God means what he says and says what he means. So the tribulation begins. And by the way, let's talk a little bit about these phrases we're going to see. For the great day of the wrath of the Lamb uh, is come, and who shall be able to stand? That's, re that's in Revelation chapter 6. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, this is looking ahead a little bit, he shall begin to sound, the mystery of the God should be finished. That's in chapter 10. And thy wrath is come, chapter 11. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. The bowls of wrath are the climactic part in chapter 15 and 16. But the wrath starts in chapter 6. That's important. Some people have written books trying to argue that the wrath is later. No, 
chapter 6 says, it's, 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 uh, it speaks of it there. Pour out the bowls of wrath upon the earth in chapter 16 and so forth. And finally, at the end of chapter 16, it is done. It is finished. We'll deal with that as we get there. The term day of the Lord is a subject of a lot of confusion. In Revelation chapter 1, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, is the way it's translated. Mistranslation, that's not Sunday. It's the day of the Lord. It's got nothing to do with the day of the week. It's got, he was transported somehow ahead in time to the day of the Lord. Now, what is the day of the Lord? It's used 20 times in eight prophetic books in the Old Testament. It's used three times in the New Testament. In Acts 20, it's actually quoting from Joel in that case. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 5 and Second Peter 3. It's sometimes called the day of God by Second Peter. It's in the same verses that he speaks of the day of the Lord. Day of wrath in Zephaniah chapter 1. Day of the Lord's wrath in Zephaniah chapter 1. Day of darkness in Joel and Zephaniah. These terms, obviously, uh, you're going to find a couple of dozen times throughout the scripture. So let's get at it. This is all by way of a warm-up, right? The opening of the sealed scroll in chapter 6. I want to call your attention to the overall structure of this part of the book of Revelation. I think most people are rec recognize that there are seven seals, and we're going to open them one at a time. What many people don't realize is that all through the book, when there's a group of seven judgments, there is a parenthesis between the sixth and seventh. It's almost as if by the time you get to seal number six, you're out of breath. You need to gasp a little bit. He changes the subject for a little bit. Then he deals with seven. And so we're going to discover what they call a parenthetical chapter. In this case, it's a whole chapter that I'm just going to call a parenthetical chapter. We'll deal with it when we get there. When you get to seal number seven, it turns out to break down into seven trumpets. And those seven trumpets, when you get to trumpet number six, you discover there's a parenthesis. In this case, there's several chapters inserted there that are sort of stand back and overview kinds of chapters. We'll deal with that, obviously, when we get there. When you get to the seventh trumpet, it breaks down into seven bowls of wrath. And they get poured out. I believe that, that some scholars say these are all in parallel with each other. Others say they're all sequential. I think they're sequential, and I think they're like birth pangs. They're increasingly intense. It's almost like what, we, what an engineer would call a logarithmic scale, if you will. But even between the sixth and seventh, you have to look for it to find it. There's just a little one verse, change of subject, but there's a parenthesis there. You know, if you're sensitive to the architecture, you sense it. And uh, I think one of the things I'm hoping you carry away from the study, aside from the details, is a healthy respect for the total architecture of the Bible, not just the book of Revelation. The integration of the total 66 books is what our ministry is all about. Once you really discover that for yourself, it changes your attitude towards God's Word. Now, the seven-sealed book is a scroll. The first four seals have a special label. They are the four horsemen. They are so well known in literature that the four horsemen of the apocalypse is an idiom in literature, used in general just to mean the, you know, the advent of terrible wars and so forth. And, uh, but uh, it's used as a, just a literary phrase. But it comes from the first four seals, which we're going to jump into. Thought, you'd, thought we'd never get there, didn't you? John says, and I saw when the Lamb... By the way, I saw. These are not visions. He saw it happening. There's a difference. He heard, he saw, all the way through. We covered that before. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. This is no little whisper. This is heavy stuff. One of the four living creatures said, uh, uh, come and see. Now the word come is erkomai, which is really come, but it's like proceed or follow. It's as if you've arrived and your escort is telling you to come along and proceed into the room. It's a, it's a term that, it's come, but not like you're coming from something, you're coming to something is the, is the closest, it's a better translation. That's why some, uh, some uh, translation will say go or proceed. It's probably a little... Go forward, see? And uh, it's the middle verse of a primary verb. And uh, anyway, so much for that. Okay, the first seal is the white horse. It's interesting that this guy is an imposter, but he's such a good imposter that most commentaries miss it. <laughs> a lot of commentators say, Jesus on a white horse, it must be Christ. Wait a minute, guys. Christ is opening the book, dispatching these seals. And, and uh, so uh, if, he's, if this is Jesus Christ, he's riding in bad company, okay? This is the overcoming warrior that's coming here. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now this crown is not a diadem. It's a Stephanus. 
It's a victor's crown, not a ruling crown. A little different. The, the Greek implication is different. Horses, by the way, all through the Old Testament are used as symbols of judgment. And Zechariah does that rather eloquently, and, and it's alluded to several other places. It's, a, it's a, a phrase that's made strange for our ears, but that's common. And again, I say this is, this is a, the victor's crown, the Stephanos, not the diadem. Jesus Christ will show up on a white horse in chapter 19. And uh, we published this. We have a, a briefing package on each of these horsemen, and, and we had five, five sections. We had the five horsemen of the apocalypse. And I remember when we published this, someone called our ministry doesn't Chuck know there's only four horsemen? And the, the answer is, of course, we're the fifth horseman being the Jesus Christ in, the, in chapter 19. But I overheard that person on the phone say, well, according to us, we try to give you more for your money. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he was kidding, of course, and he made it clear, but anyway. This guy is carrying a bow, not a sword, a bow. And most people presume, there's a lot of conjectures here, I'm going to show, uh, the bow implies darts or arrows in contrast to the sword of Jesus Christ that'll be in Revelation 19. But it's interesting, some scholars point out that this may in intentionally symbolize Nimrod the hunter who had a bow, he was a hunter in Genesis 10, 11. And uh, it's interesting to me because I tend to view the coming world leader as Nimrod the second. And we'll deal with that when we get to chapter 13 when we'll deal with him in, 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 in specifics. But there's a subtlety here that I haven't seen any commentator pick up on, which means I'm probably wrong, but I'll share it with you for your own amusement. The word bow, if you'd use it concordance, occurs once before in the scripture. It's the same word that's a token of a covenant that God gave Noah. Remember, he promised there wouldn't be a flood anymore, so he gave him a token of that covenant, which was a rainbow. The same word in the Hebrew and the Greek the toxon in the Greek, in the Septuagint, is the same word that's used here in Revelation in the Greek. It means a weapon. It can also mean a rainbow. One possibility, it's a, perhaps a, a stretch, but a possibility is the idiom here is the Holy Spirit using a deliberate pun. That what this guy has is the token of a covenant. Because his def definitive role will be to enforce a covenant with Israel for seven years that he then violates. Follow me? So this illusion may be two things. It may be a weapon, but it also may be a, like a pun, an illusion. To, and, and the Holy Spirit does use puns. It's one of the 200 different um, parts of, uh, figures of speech in the Scripture that are cataloged in our book. Something else, when you go to Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, speaking of this coming world leader, it says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace he shall destroy many. This is not a military leader at first. He later becomes very powerful militarily. He gets on the scene and makes his reputation as a peacemaker. By peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And go, that passage goes on. In Daniel 9.27, in the 70th week passage, it, he is mentioned here. He, he's the prince that shall come, and he shall confirm the covenant, or enforce, actually is the word, enforce the covenant with many for one week. See, he may not sign a treaty. He may just enforce the, the covenant for Israel to have the land. It may not be a new treaty, as many people visualize. It could be. We don't know. But he may simply enforce the covenant, the covenant for Israel, with many for, the many being an idiom for Israel. For, for one week, that is the last week of years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, you shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined will be poured out upon the desolate. Well, anyway, that's the 70 weeks. We won't beat that here. The prince that shall come. He is the seed of the serpent. In Genesis chapter 3, when God declares war on Satan, he makes allusion to the seed of the woman, the title of Christ, but he also speaks of the seed of the serpent. There's an allusion coming. The Old Te there are over 33 titles of this guy in the Old Testament. I thought we'd go through each one in detail. But our time wouldn't permit it. I'll just give you a couple of samples. See the serpent in Genesis 3, 15. The idol shepherd. I'll show you that one in a minute. The little horn of Daniel 7. The little horn of Daniel 8. The prince that shall come in Daniel 9. The willful king of Daniel 11 and so forth. In the New Testament, there are 13 in the New Testament. He's called the beast in Revelation 11. He's called the false prophet in Revelation 13. The antichrist or pseudochrist in 1 John 2. The lawless one in 2 Thessalonians. You know, it's interesting that John, the author of Revelation, doesn't use antichrist in the book of Revelation. 
He uses it actually in a little different sense in his epistles. But let's not badger that. It's called the law. It's 1 2 Thessalonians 2. The man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. He, one who comes in his own name in John 5. Jesus used that. Son of perdition, 2 Thessalonians 2 and so on. His characteristics, he's an intellectual genius. He's a persuasive orator. He's a shrewd politician. He's a financial genius. He's a forceful military leader later. He's a powerful organizer. He's a unifying religious guru and lots of others. Lots of passages, lots of studies. He is going to be the most attractive guy the world has ever seen come on the stage. But there is a physical description, only one that I know of in the Bible. It's in the last verse of Zechariah 11, where Zechariah says, Woe to the idle shepherd. Not idle like lazy, I-D-O-L, false worshiping type uh, shepherd. That leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. What does that mean? I have no idea. But it may explain why when people pledge allegiance to him, they take his mark and number on their hand, right hand, or their forehead. In other words, apparently, these characters, we suspect, this conjecture, we suspect that these impediments of his eye and his hand are the aftermath of the head wound that we're going to hear a lot about. That may be just a vestige. And in identifying with him, people take on a symbol, symbolic representation of that head wound, of the eye, or the, that, that's just conjecture. You see, it's not, as we'll get, when we get to Revelation 13, we'll deal with this whole business of barcodes and numbers and so forth, but everybody's got it backwards. It's not, it's his number that we put on, not our number that's the issue. He can enforce that by us having a number that we need for com commerce. But the issue isn't using that number. The issue is taking on his number as a Pledge of Allegiance, which if you do, you forever are uh, banned from salvation. It's the one thing you can do that, may, that clearly closes the door to salvation. So that's why there's a lot of emphasis in that as we go on. So the seven seal scroll. We've been through the first one, the white horseman, conquering and to conquer. Let's take the second seal, the red horse, which refers to wars. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see, and there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? So we have wars. Now we get to the third seal, the black horse. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Black, by the way, is often connected with famine in Lamentations 4, Jeremiah 14, and other passages. In fact, to eat bread by weight is a Jewish expression implying scarcity. It's one of the ways they refer... But to have to eat bread by weight is a term implying uh, scarcity of food. And that's in Leviticus 26, Ezekiel 4, and some other places idiomatically. The black horse, as we'll see from the next verse, clearly represents not just famine, but the cause of that famine may surprise you. And I heard voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now the chenix, which is about two quarts, is a measure of wheat for a full day's work. And uh, this is in Homer's Odyssey for uh, authorities. Herodotus also refers to it and so on. Um, and uh, it, it also was a, uh, a day's ration for a trooper, for a soldier in, in, uh, in uh, uh, the army of Xerxes. Um, here, it denied, what it basically is saying, it's going to take you a full day's wage for a loaf of bread. It'll take you uh, three, you can get one, one loaf of bread, so to speak, of wheat, or three measures of barley, which is normally animal feed. So it implies, this implies a scarcity of food. But there's another other issue, issue here, and that is, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. There's going to be luxuries available. What this implies in the most uh, 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 analysis, and also from Revelation 13 and also Amos chapter 8, uh, makes an interesting allusion here. I'll come back to um, 
We have worldwide famine, but if you've studied famines, you'll discover something rather disturbing. They usually are caused by politics, not scarcity. The scarcity occurs because of abuse or political expediencies. And uh, uh, this may be the same thing because there is oil and wine that they can't get at. So the rich still get richer and the poor get destitute. That's what it really boils down to. Now, Amos chapter 8, verse 11 makes reference to a very unusual kind of famine that's not necessarily what's in view here yet, and that is a famine of the Word of God. We already are seeing that in America. If you've ever studied a famine, you know that when people are starving, they will eat anything, even members of their family. The stories are legion if you've really studied this. The same thing's true spiritually. We're in a famine of the Word of God. It's tragic how few churches really preach expositionally the Word of God. And uh, when people are starving, they'll eat anything. That's why they embrace these bizarre fringe issues, where it's the Kabbalah on the Jewish side or the New Age on the Gentile side, whatever. Anyway, let's move on. So we have the black horse as the third seal. Re white, red, black. I, I put the little colors on here to help you remember their order. Now, the fourth seal is the pale horse in your translation. The word in the Greek is actually chloros, which is the word for, uh, a, a, uh, frankly, a vomit green, a, a pale green. It speaks of death. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And be, I looked and behold a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. This involves two riders, death and hell. The death of the body and the death of the soul. And power was given over unto them over one-fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, this beast is... Um, um, Every, all of us tend to presume that the beasts are four-footed mam mammals. The most dangerous beasts on the face of the earth are microscopic. And, and uh, this may be speaking of, of pestilence uh, uh, as well as hunger. So, okay, we've got the four horsemen. In Ezekiel 14, there's an interesting phrase. Ezekiel 14, verse 21, it says, For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, and the noise of beast, and the pestilence, to cut it off from it man and beast. Here's the fourfold pestilences mentioned here in Ezekiel. Let's get to the fifth seal. When, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that had been slain for the word of God. And remember, the word of God is also a title for Jesus Christ have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The Greek word for, for uh, witness is uh, martyr. And martus, actually. And uh, that's where we get the term martyr. It really means witness. And uh, so we're, we hear the crying of the suffering of people through the ages here. They're not calling for their vengeance. They're calling for God's justice to be um, manifested. I want you to notice that these souls there are not sleeping. They're conscious. There's all kinds of discussion among scholars, and no one has the answers, because they may not be resurrected yet, and yet they were raiment. Does that mean they have an, in, an intermediate body? And there's all that kind of discussion. Who knows? It's, it, it, those are all just, they're interesting, but they're just conjectures as to how that relates. Revelation chapter 6, verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and also, uh, also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So they're anxious for this all to be resolved. God says, great, but not yet. Just cool it for a little bit longer, in effect. Mr. Translation. Avenging the blood of the saints. We find that here in Revelation 6. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? 
in chapter 16, for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. In Revelation 17, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. We'll talk about that in great detail when we get to chapter 17 with some very disturbing insights. For God hath avenged you on her, Revelation 18, the next chapter. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Wow. And hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. We're going to find out about this woman, Mystery Babylon. So this fifth seal of the martyrs that are asked to just be cool for a little longer. Then we have the wild one. I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, what is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. What does that all mean? I have no idea. I tell you, the more I've studied it over 50 years, the more I've leaned to taking it all literally. Not symbolically. Mountains are governments. Yes, they are. In Daniel 2 and so on. I, I suspect there's something else going on here. Earthquakes. This is the first of three big ones. Revelation 6, 11, and 16 will encounter these big earthquakes. Some people try to synchronize them as if they're all happening, you know, that they're different accounts of the same event. I don't think so, but that's anyone's view. There are literal earthquakes, of course, all through the scripture. You can study those with your notes. There are earthquakes of the sun turning black, mentioned in the Old Testament and the New, in regards to this. The word seismos, which is the Greek term for shaking, is all through the scripture. and You can take a concordance and chase those down on your own. It's a fruitful study. But there are cosmic of The sun became black as sackcloth. That's in Isaiah 13 and Joel 2. Uses the same language of this event. So I tend to take it seriously. The moon became like blood. That's in Isaiah 13 and 24 and Joel 2 and Matthew 24. These, these terms are not distinct, unique here. They're four different places. It mentions that same expression. Now is that just because the air is so filled with nuclear winter that you, the moon looks... I have, there's all kinds of ways to rationalize these things. I don't think we need to do that. I think we just take it what it says and stand back and watch. <laughs> the stars fell into the earth even as a fig tree cast their untimely figs. Is that a meteor shower? Are, there, are those are stars are sometimes used of angels, idiomatically? Could be. The sky and the heaven depart as a scroll when it is rolled together. Now this is probably the most troubling of them all, and it's the one that I take most literally. Every mountain and the island were moved out of their places. Well, let's take a look at some of this. Stretching the heavens. You may recall from our Genesis study, we now know there is a fabric of space. Space, most of us think, is empty, absolute vacuum. No, it turns out an absolute vacuum has physical properties, strangely enough. This is more than a metaphor. Job 9 says, it speaks of God as who stretches out the heavens. Psalm 104 speaks of stretching out the heaven like a tent curtain. Isaiah 40 speaks of who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. These idioms are broadly used throughout the Bible. He has stretched out the heavens in Jeremiah 10. The Lord who stretches out the heavens in, Ze in Zechariah 12. We could go through a lot more of them. Stretching the heaven is a very, very frequent phrase over a dozen times in the scripture. Space, we now know scientifically, is not an empty vacuum. Isaiah says it can be torn in, tw in, 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 in chapter 64. Psalm 102 says it can be worn out like a garment. It's not like the entropy loss. It can be shaken in Hebrews 12, Haggai 2, and Isaiah 13. It can be burnt up, Peter threatens in 2 Peter 3. He warns us of that. It can split apart like a scroll, as we've just seen here. And we'll see in Hebrews 1 and Isaiah 34, it can be rolled up like a mantle or a scroll. The fact that it can be rolled up in the scripture implies it has more than one dimension. Rolled up. If it can be rolled up, there's some dimension in which it must be thin in order to be rolled. And if space can be bent, there must be a direction into which it can be bent. So if you have something two-dimensional that can be rolled up, that means you roll it up in three dimensions, doesn't it? Follow me? If you have a three-dimensional thing you can roll up, you better have four dimensions, etc. 
So there are additional spatial dimensions. We talk about that in our briefing packages. I'll leave it for now, but just recognize what this saying here may be far more cosmically relevant than just a figure of speech. Back to chapter 6, verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and rich men and chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the who? Of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? This passage fascinates me for some surprising reasons I'll show you in a minute. The kings of the earth, all the great men, all the rich men, all the leaders, chief captains, mighty men, every bondman, are doing what? They're trying to hide. How do they hide? They crawl into caves in the mountains. Rocks cover us. They don't know what else to do. I think this is fascinating because I have discovered something that I haven't found anyone that agrees with me, but I'll share it with you and you can come to your own conclusions. And by the way, I want to, before I leave this slide, I want to show you the wrath of the Lamb. His wrath is... We are in chapter 6. Wrath is happening. Ask, ask the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, what's going on. They'll tell you. The wrath continues from chapter 6 through 19 till the Lord interrupts it. The wrath is this whole period. Okay. The book of Joshua, I was fascinated when I discovered the word Joshua is the name of Jesus. It's, Jeho it's the Jewish version of Yehoshua. Okay. And I'm fascinated because my premise is, my observation is, the book of Joshua appears to be a model, an anticipatory model of the book of Revelation in some surprising ways. Yehoshua, the fact that there's an Old Testament book with Jesus' name on it caught my attention. And who is Joshua? He's a military commander dispossessing the land of the usurpers. That's what Joshua's all about. That's what Jesus is going to be doing in Revelation, except the decimal point's been moved over. The whole planet Earth, that's an issue. In Joshua, there's a seven-year campaign. Ooh, that was interesting. And it was original ten nations. He's dealing with the last seven of them. Three were already been set down. I, did, I learned that from the uh, Israel Defense Forces when I was briefed by a military guy. He happened to make allusion to the fact, just like Joshua, uh, you know, was fighting seven of ten. I thought, what? I never noticed that. The Torah is ignored in Jericho. The Battle of Jericho violates every rule in the Torah you can find. The Sabbath is ignored. They don't rest on the Sabbath. They do it seven times as much. The Levites are not supposed to go to war. They're the leading the procession in Jericho. So you begin to realize something's weird about Jericho. Who fought the Battle of Jericho? It wasn't Joshua. It was Jesus Christ. Read the last few verses of chapter 5. The strange, this, Joshua encounters this guy who has a sword drawn. Josh says, are you with us or our enemies? He challenged him like a sentinel. And what does the guy say to Joshua? Take off your shoes, you're on hallowed ground. Joshua would remember where that came from when he was with Moses on Mount Sinai. And what's the first thing Joshua does in his attack? He sends in two witnesses. That's exactly what's going to happen in chapter 11 in the book of Revelation. There are seven trumpet events. We'll deal, detail some of this when we get to chapter 8 in the, in the trumpets and all that business. And by the way, those seven trumpets... Very strange story. They're to march around once a day for six days, keeping silent. On the seventh day, they march around six times, keeping silent. On the seventh time of the seventh day, they shout, blow the trumpets, and the walls come down. Now, I was amused. Can you imagine selling that to the staff? <laughs> hey, guys, here's the plan. <laughs> really? <laughs> in chapter 8, verse 1, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. Strange phrase that precedes all this. The enemies of Joshua are confederated under a leader in Jerusalem who calls himself Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness. And he gets defeated by hailstones and fire from heaven with signs in the sun and the moon. The long day of Joshua and all of that in chapter 10. It all deals with this. It's a prelude in miniature of what's going to happen on the planet Earth in Revelation. But here's the kicker. What do the kings do at the end of Joshua? They hide in caves. Joshua seals the caves until they're ready for him, then he opens it and he takes care of them. It's the, once you see this, read the book of Joshua, read the book of Revelation, come to your own conclusions. Uh, I haven't found a commentary that develops this, and so uh, that must probably be some, something I'm overlooking here, but I'll leave it up to you to ch chase it down. 
Why is God doing all this? In Isaiah 23, verse 9, he says, The Lord of hosts hath purposed it to stain the pride of all glory and to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. So much for pride. The pride of nations, the pride of the earth, the pride of mankind. So we have what I'll call the sixth seal. We'll just call it cosmic changes of some kind. Now you'll notice from my outline here that before we get to chat, the seal number seven, which will be in chapter eight, it'll open up the seven trumpets, there is a parenthesis. And that parenthesis is chapter seven. And so that's what I'm going to encourage you to uh, read for next time. Before I go there, I want, to notice, you know, I want you to notice something. Remember when we were talking about the Olivet Discourse? That there was a series of signs that Matthew and Luke both talk about. False Christ, wars, famines, death, and martyrs, and the global upheaval. Remember? How interesting it is that that's exactly the same pattern in Matthew from 24, verses 4 through 13, Luke 21, verses 4 through 25, and Revelation chapter 6, from 1 through 17. The parallel there is inescapable. Subtle, but inescapable. And we talked about the heptatic structure. Now, before we get to 7, we're going to have chapter 7, which is going to be a parenthesis in which 144,000 are sealed from 12 tribes of Israel. That's going to raise a whole bunch of issues. Which tribes, why, and what's going on? It sounds awfully Jewish. If somebody rings your doorbell with a long tie and bicycles and stuff and says he's one of the 144,000, ask him which tribe he's from. Um, the seventh seal will deal with the, with the trumpets, and then we'll have a parenthesis, a very, very illuminating series of parentheses from chapters 10 through 14. And then, of course, the big, the big finish with the seven bowls and uh, the advent of Jesus Christ. And so, for the next session, I want you to read chapter 7, and also read chapter 14, because that's the fruit. Seven is the sealing and the commissioning of these 144,000, and what they're all about shows up in chapter 14. So we might try to slip chapter 14 in the next time, pick up a little slack in our schedule here. I want you to, as you read that, do a little homework, figure out which tribes are missing, and there's more than one. Everybody knows the tribe of Dan is missing. Great. Why? Which ones are missing and why? And if you, if you have any resources, I encourage you to consider dig out the prophecies by both Moses and, and uh, by Jacob and Moses on the uh, tribe of Dan. There'll be some big surprises on that. And what is the role of 144,000? That's the key central issue. Next time, we're going to see 12,000 sealed from each of the 12 tribes. And where is the tribe of Dan? It's missing. And where's the tribe of Ephraim? It's missing, sort of. It is and it isn't. And I'll leave that with you for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.